talk about my voice, or let's not and say we did. <laughs> I liked singing from a young age and I wasn't insecure about it. I sang in the choir for a short time in public school and later, when I did my bar mitzvah haftorah, I was told I had a beautiful voice. You should be a cantor, my mom's friends would say. Uh, no thank you. <laughs> At that point, I wasn't screaming like the damned howling in Hades, as my reputation would later have it. I would soon be singing cream songs and blues songs in a sort of tenor soprano, or if you prefer, a soprano castrato style. <laughs> I was a fan of guys with a higher range, like Stevie Marriott in The Small Faces and Humble Pie. Humble Pies Live at the Fillmore was a hugely influential record to me and most of my peers. I Don't Need No Doctor was a huge song to me, and you can hear its influence in my early singing with Rush. I would later often be compared to Robert Plant. Compliment. And while he certainly pushed me into higher registers, I think a comparison with Marriott is a bit more accurate. He had a soulful voice with a strong vibrato, but he rocked and he loved to rock. Soon, John Anderson's mellifluous singing would affect me too. He had a high range, but his voice wasn't scratchy or abrasive. It was beautiful, soulful, and emotive, not unlike a schoolboy chorister. I really wanted to sing like that. Another singer who impressed me was Roger Hodgson on the early Supertramp records. And I liked both Paul Simon and Joni Mitchell a lot. Through the years, there were many others, of course. I was a huge fan of Bjork later in life. No one would think to make that connection. But there are certain words I sing in Rush in a very Bjork-like manner. But I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. <laughs> I wasn't aiming for raspiness. I just responded intuitively. Where my voice went was out of necessity relating to what we were writing in the key we were writing it in. And when we were young, we weren't very savvy about keys. If the key we wrote a song in felt right musically, I would just have to make it do vocally. What we came to learn was that in certain lower registers, my voice had no power. But when I booted up an octave, there was the power. Watching the movie Coda recently, I was struck by the scene in which the choir teacher tries to bring out his students' inner frustrations, coaxing her to sing from the gut. She's the only hearing member of a deaf family. Even if it's an ugly sound, he says, it will feel good. Turn your angst into power. And it dawned on me that my earliest vocal style may also have been rooted in my childhood listening to the stories of what my parents had endured in the concentration camps and suffering all that bullying and alienation, so that when I began to sing, it all came rushing out like a screaming banshee. I was releasing all those suppressed emotions just by stepping up to the mic and screaming, Yeah! Oh, yeah! <laughs> of course, then I have to learn how to actually sing. John Griffin once wrote in the Montreal Gazette that I sounded like a guinea pig with an amphetamine habit. <laughs> in Circus, Dan Neuger said, if Lee's voice were any higher and raspier, his audience would consist exclusively of dogs and extraterrestrials. <laughs> I kind of like that. And in 1979, perhaps kindlier, John Rockwell would comment in the New York Times, Mr. Lee sings in a spare but unusual way, a brittle and androgynous tenor. Okay. <laughs> so yes, my style did come across to some as quite abrasive, especially before we began making records. But you have to put yourself back in 1974. It's all context, right? Here in 2023, our collective ears have become much more open. We've heard every style of music, every kind of singer. Bands weigh heavier than Rush, 
vocalists even shriekier than I used to be. So imagine you're a critic back then in a reverberant arena. There's this three-piece band you don't know, and this hairy guy is shouting at you. I get that if you consider yourself more sophisticated than the average music fan, our 26 minutes on stage must have seemed a loud mess. But we were truly into it, playing our parts with honest conviction, and raw or not, we were connecting with a growing number of people. I guess sometimes the official tastemakers are the last to know. Each new Rush album gave me another opportunity to improve as a player and a songwriter, but especially as a singer. It likely became so important to me because of all the heat I took for my voice over the years. But sometimes my attitude was like, hey, you don't like the way I sing? Well, then I politely invite you to fuck the fuck off. <laughs> you belong to something more suitable to your sensitive taste. <laughs> often to meet my own standards, if no one else's, I worked hard at it. But then there's singing with the cold. There's really nothing worse than going out on stage in that condition, becoming hoarse, singing badly, unable to hit the notes. And I did it far too many times. That's a special kind of torture. With our show-must-go-on attitude, we resisted canceling unless it was absolutely unavoidable. I went on stage with tonsillitis, croup coughs, even a bloody nose swallowing blood. And with this nose, that's a large <laughs> amount of blood. <laughs> and feeding a spittoon throughout the entire show. When I was sick, my bass tech Scully would also keep a shit ton of Kleenex in a wastebasket at the side of the stage, running out between songs with hot tea, lemon, and honey. One time, my ears became so congested that my trusty ear, nose, and throat doctor in Toronto had to puncture one of my eardrums to drain the fluid out, simply so I could fly to the next gig. When flying on tour, you see, during decompression at alt altitude, fluid in your sinus cavities can become excruciatingly painful and leave you partially deaf for days. And that's a whole lot of fun. So I screamed blue murder when he inserted that needle. Then leaving his office, I noticed the young kid in the waiting room, pale as a ghost, <laughs> staring at me in horror. And I said with a wink, you're up, kid. <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to thank, I would like to thank very much Thank you for coming out tonight. We want to take a short pause, and then we'll be back to answer your questions. So in the meantime, check this trailer out. Thank you.